attack on the working class in Turkey and the attack on the Kurdish people has been going on for many, many years, many decades in fact. And what we're trying to do in this meeting is to provide some appeal to American uh, working people because what's happening, the pogrom that's going on against the Kurdish people is really not being covered uh, in the United States. Also, we are working to get links between American workers and unions uh, with the uh, people of Turkey. And there have been statements of solidarity from the San Francisco Labor Council. And also my union has made a statement and we'll have a, a, a delegate a representative speaking about that. They have to fight for their democratic rights, not just uh, in Turkey, but even in this country, the United States. And um, in San Francisco, there's been attack on democratic rights on journalists here who are covering demonstrations. Journalists have been arrested for trying to cover demonstrations and prevented from doing their work as journalists. And also teachers, uh, education workers have come under attack. And we have here a representative of the Teachers Union at Community College, which they're trying to privatize. And privatization, and they're, not going to succeed. they're not going to succeed, but privatization is an international issue because the first time I went to Turkey, uh, 1992, uh, when I arrived in, in Turkey, there was a march uh, uh, of uh, Turkish uh, telephone workers, telecom workers, against privatization. And there was a rally of about 5,000 uh, telephone workers. They were privatizing uh, telecom in Turkey uh, as part of the Structural Adjustment Program of the United States. The United States was pushing through the IMF, International Monetary Fund. And guess who, get one of the people that was going to benefit from that privatization was Terence Eagleburger, who was at that time the Secretary of State. He actually was buying shares in the Turkish telecom company. So we arrived at, I interviewed people, uh, and also that we went to Ankara, and then there was a march of 60,000 public workers uh, through Turkey to Ankara to the capital, and that was blocked by the military, the police. They prevented them from marching. Uh, to the capital. We interviewed workers there, privatization attacks and that kind of thing. This was being supported by the United States and as a matter of fact what happened was while they were privatizing education uh, and uh, telecom, they were doing that by supporting uh, fundamentalists and at that time uh, the Gulen, Fadullah Gulen uh, in Turkey and this was a uh, uh, mullah who uh, was setting up schools in Turkey, religious schools. And these schools were funded by the state, actually. They were funded by the, by the state in Turkey. And he was uh, left Turkey and came to the United States, and at the, really with the collaboration of the CIA, because he was setting up these schools in Turkestan, all over the Middle East, and it was charged by these countries that the schools were being used as CIA outposts, that they were reporting back to the CIA about what was going on. In any event, he started to set up schools in the United States, uh, the Gulen School, it's called Magnolia Chain, and it turns out he is the largest operator of, of charter schools in the United States now. And they want to expand the schools into Anaheim and to Los Angeles. In fact, the Anaheim uh, Board of Education recently made a statement against charter schools because the way the laws are written in the United States or in California, they're forced to bring in these charter schools whether a local school board wants them or not. So this issue of privatization of charter schools is not just an issue of Turkey, it's an issue right here in the United States, uh, the fight against privatization. And we have a petition here. We're working on getting a ballot initiative in California to repeal charter schools. And the ballot initiative, uh, it will be in the November ballot, but we have to get uh, 370,000 signatures, which is a lot of signatures. But we have to defend public education and we have to defend the right of free speech, the right of journalists to tell their stories. And that's the purpose we're having this. And we're going to be sending this video uh, to the uh, Kurdish, Kurdish people, to journalists in Turkey, to know that there's solidarity in the United States. And also, uh, we are going to work internationally uh, to build links and build solidarity. So I wanted to first uh, have some people bring greetings to the meeting. Uh, we have uh, Roger Scott, who's on the executive board of AFT 2121, and he's been active in supporting uh, resolutions of solidarity with Turkish people and Kurdish people at the San Francisco Labor Council. So welcome, welcome uh, Roger Scott. As you all know, the struggle at City College is, is basically a matter of accreditation, <laughs> but the people who, are, who brought this plague on City College, uh, are, are, they have a privatizing agenda. 
they get money from right-wing think tanks and they're, uh, they're going to fail. And we would like to send our solidarity to our sisters and brothers in Turkey who are struggling for, for, for dignity and democracy and, and, uh, and they're, they're fighting, as, as Steve pointed out, Steve and I don't agree on everything, but we agree on a lot of things. And certainly uh, the, the struggle against privatization is one that affects all of us. Um, when you have the, the unequal distribution of wealth that we do at, at, this, at this time in this country, uh, rich people in any society don't want to fund public institutions that, that, that the people need. And the two main ones that are that are starved for funds from the state in this country, and and and, uh, and not properly governed by by the the people that we elect, are are in public education, public and health, and I think the the struggle that that you have in Turkey, you have the same struggle in Mexico, all over the world, the rich people. Um, simply don't want to pay their share of taxes and and some of us would like to see the the capitalist system uh, replaced but whether that happens or not in the meantime we would like to see a humane form of capitalism where the the rich and the affluent pay their share to fund public services so uh, you don't need to hear much more from me but we do want to as as a member of as a teacher at city college since 1972 and a member of the executive board of that union for most of those years. Uh, the, the people at City College of San Francisco send their, and especially our union, send your, our greetings and fellowship and solidarity to our brothers and sisters in the struggle in Turkey. And by the way, I was in Turkey once for a few, for a few weeks, and, um, and at that time, and I think it's still true, uh, you know, the Tur Turks, Turkey is a, is a main ally of this country. However, of all the countries in that part of the world, the Turks oppress the Kurds as much as any other group of people in, in, that, in that section of the world. And that, that hasn't changed, and we would, we would like to see a change. So our, our support and solidarity go to our comrades in Turkey. Solidarity speaker is from my union, uh, the CWA Media Workers. His name is Rick Nee. He's the vice president of uh, my local media workers, uh, CWA and our local has passed a resolution he's going to talk about. So welcome, Rick Nee. Thank you, Brother Steve, for inviting me here today. As a uh, journalist, of course, I'm not supposed to tell you all how left-wing my politics are. Uh, I don't mind telling you, though, that uh, I've been union active for uh, a better part of four decades, and I'm damn proud of that. As uh, Steve mentioned, I am Richard Nee. Vice President, California of the Pacific Media Workers Guild, News Guild, CWA, Local 39521. I also chair the Locals uh, Legislative and, and uh, Political Committee, and I'm active in the Locals Freelancers Unit. If there are any freelancers among you, uh, please join us. We certainly welcome your participation in the Guild. Journalists in uh, Northern California, Hawaii, and Nevada are a major component of our local membership. And the imprisonment of our fellow reporters, bloggers, photographers, and videographers, not only in Turkey, but in countries such as Ethiopia, Iran, and yes, the United States, is deeply troubling. So we in the Pacific Media Workers Guild extend our heartfelt thanks to you for sharing and, and expressing that concern. We all know that knowledge is a critical element of power. And that is why those in seats of government and in executive suites are seizing control of the content, the volume, and the flow of information that reaches us, the people. We must fight this insidious conspiracy. And to succeed, we must remain united to that purpose. Toward that end, the Guild joins you this afternoon in calling for the immediate release of those imprisoned for committing journalism. Again, I thank you. Here, here. And this, uh, I want to thank Rick, and this resolution 
uh, that our local pass will be coming up uh, in front of the San Francisco Labor Council on Monday, and I'm sure that it will pass and will be circulated to workers and unions uh, throughout California and nationally because it's a national, it's an international issue. Uh, so we, we're going to have one song first, and then we'll go on. Francis Collins is a, a labor musician, a troubadour, and he's going to sing a song uh, for us uh, in solidarity with the workers and Kurdish people of Turkey. So welcome, Francis. When the unions and screws, the workers' lives shall run, there can be no greater power in an appropriate song for working people for solidarity and we are in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Turkey and that's why we're having this meeting and we're going to build that solidarity because that is the only thing really that can defend us our solidarity and our action so our next speaker is going to be Mehmet Bayran and he's a uh, journalist syndica and he's going to talk about the uh, struggle as a slideshow we have lived this through 1980s where our movement was mostly uh, isolated and we paid the price for it. So I am really glad that all over the world now, the working classes are joining hands. And in this, we must uh, do our part to, uh, as Turkish uh, working class, to extend our hands to our Kurdish comrades, to our Kurdish people, in their time when they are paying the price for the nationalism in Turkey. When I had uh, prepared this presentation about a month or a uh, month and a half ago, it was the Turkey nears a civil war. I believe that that time has passed now and Turkey is actually in a civil war now. And the reasons uh, we are going to, we are going to come, uh, uh, and I'm gonna try to pass it's a really long presentation because I want to give the past, I want to give the basis of what's happening today. And if we don't understand the roots of nationalism, the roots of imperialism and its, uh, and its reflection in Turkey, it's going to be very hard to understand because people usually uh, approach us and they say, why is Turkey doing this? Why don't they do this or do that? What I'm saying is that it's more of a structural, structural issue here where Turkey has to do this because of its relationship to imperialism, because of the type of capitalism that we have in Turkey that they are bound to do this. But the latest events actually started happening mostly around June when uh, the, uh, uh, around uh, uh, November uh, actually, when the elections took place and the uh, ruling Turkish uh, uh, the, uh, party, religious party, AKP, lost the elections in the first June side, but then there was a re-election done and that they were barely get able to get in. But the surprising issue here was that nobody expected the Kurdish party, HDP, that, to emerge as strongly as they were. So we have to understand what's happening. What you are seeing here is an illegal palace that was built by the, uh, by the current uh, government. It's illegal because neither the engineers, nor the architects, nor the approvers, nobody has approved this and it's completely illegal. 1,100 rooms strong with uh, you know, palace type furniture and so on and so forth. So the, um, we have to understand that the Turkish ruling party, AKP, Justice and Development Party, is a darling of imperialism. Uh, I've heard many, many uh, people claim that uh, Erdogan is religious, so he's against the West and so on and so forth, but that is not true at all since the, the only power that keeps Erdogan still in power is the United States and the European Union, as we're gonna see. 
Uh, the main players in the election were the Republican People's Party. It's the state party for since 1920s, and it is very, very connected to the Turkish state. And the real powers do stay with it. But the most important part that we have to understand with the Republican People's Party is that it is the carrier of the Turkish state ideology, which is Kemalism, which means one state, one language, one, uh, one nation, uh, one religion, everything. And uh, th there's a new actually uh, study that just came out uh, a year ago that compares why Hitler was a devout, uh, you know, worshipper of Kemal Atatürk. Because most of the stuff that we've seen in fascist uh, Germany has been actually taken from the Kemalist uh, ideology of the state, one nation, one leader, one country, one uh, language type of thing. So uh, uh, Republican Party is actually today the representative of that ideology and they are not wavering at all. The other party was the Nationalist Movement Party, the Fascist Party, that uh, uh, open Fascist Party. They are the neo-Nazis, and they they have everything uh, uh, modeled uh, from the uh, Hitler's party and the Mussolini, and they are staunch racist, staunch nationalist, and they have been involved in many, many murders of progressives, and they are the force that, again, the United States uses uh, very well. Uh, they are the street power that the ruling party does not have. They are the gray wolves that go and attack whenever there is a workers' uh, uh, strike going on, uh, whenever there's a progressive movement going on. The uh, gray wolves are the ones, the, uh, uh, um, the street power of this party that goes in there. I'd like to show that although they claim to be anti-imperialist, in 1960s, the United States gave a dictum to, the, to Turkey, saying that the growth of opium in Turkey for medicinal usage, the 100% medicinal usage, was against their policy, so Turkey had to stop uh, producing opium, which Turkey was the number one exporter for the world, for the medicinal legal use. So the entire country uh, united against this United States dictum, there was one and only one party, anti-imperialist national movement party, that said United States is right, we have to toe the line. So I just want to sh uh, show you what type of an anti-imperialist they are. The uh, People's Democratic Party is the new progressive leftist and pro-Kurdish party that is taking all the heat now. In the, in the elections, it won more than 10%, which is the threshold for any party to uh, be in the parliament. So uh, the, uh, here are some, uh, you know, the voting results and HDP just barely made it with 10.75 and they have 59 representatives in the, in the parliament. And today, even as we speak, their immunity as parliamentarians are trying to be uh, removed so that they could be jailed. In 1990s, again, the Kurdish representatives were dragged on the floor by the Turkish police and dragged out of the, out of the parliament and uh, thrown into jail. Especially this lady here and uh, 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 Zana. And uh, just to show you that uh, uh, the women's representation in the HDP, 23 out of 59 uh, representatives are women. And they, the HDP, for, uh, just tries to enforce as much as possible to get women into all parts of life, not only in elections, but uh, in, the, in the regional uh, elections. When they have the uh, local politics, they have one, you know, like mayorship uh, uh, and uh, other local uh, governors, uh, they, every single one of these uh, counties or the towns have a co-chair, co-mayor, which has to be a woman. And just, I want to stress this out because most of the Kurdish areas that we see are very patriarchal, very male-dominated, very religious uh, places, and uh, putting women as co-mayors there is a revolutionary movement. And we're going to come to this democratization as we move along. 
So the elections were all controlled by police. Every uh, voting booth was controlled by police, intimidating the intimidating the uh, Kurds. And one other thing that the government did right a couple of days before the election was that to uh, 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 take over the opposition papers. Suddenly they uh, found out, uh, uh, they did not have any corruption, but they found out, that they said that, the government says that their, uh, their uh, papers, uh, their tax returns were so perfect that there had to be something wrong with it. So they took over the papers and in one day you are seeing, this is how the police is attacking the, uh, uh, the offices of the newspaper and the next day we are seeing Erdogan's picture all over the paper and the uh, uh, government is now ruling the paper and the uh, uh, manager of the paper is getting 30,000 US dollars a month. Let me repeat. 30,000 US dollars a month paid by the government to, uh, to manage this paper which has turned into nothing but a government propaganda. So this is only two days before. Uh, the uh, AKP also attacked the mainstream news uh, organizations and they broke the windows and uh, this is the representative from parliament of the AKP party who uh, was saying that no matter what the outcome is, Erdogan is still going to be the uh, president. We are not going to allow that. Uh, elections mean nothing to us. Uh, I'm going to uh, go uh, uh, past this. Uh, a very fast uh, uh, back uh, uh, is that uh, when the Ottomans, uh, Tur Turkey was created from the Ottomans, but when uh, uh, Turkey was created, we have to understand the mentality of the creation of the new, uh, new country. Uh, Turks never got over the inferiority complex that I would call they had because they believe that they are the rulers of the world. It's just like the God has given us this power. And they never uh, accepted that they were kicked out of Europe, they were kicked out of the Middle East, they were kicked out of, from here and there, and that they became a small country. So this mentality has always stayed with them and they try to find scapegoats in their, in their explanation of why Turkey is a backward country today. The number one uh, 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 scapegoat they found were the Armenians because they were not Muslims. Let's also remember that the movement that Kemal, Mustafa Kemal was in, although today we are taught, we are uh, being uh, told that they were uh, they were secularist they were you know more more modern when uh, mustafa kemal started this movement he was not secularist he was actually uh, working for the caliph to put together back the caliphate to, to the ottoman empire but when they couldn't do it then the plan b became a secular uh, secular uh, country and the secularism actually came because of the armenian issue because the Armenians had been uh, uh, had seen genocide in 1915, and the world was putting too much pressure on Turkey, saying, "Why did you do this? You have to explain." And the Turks have to explain. And the the uh, West, or what they call imperialism, was forcing Turkey to adapt uh, rules and laws to give equal equal access to the Armenians, to, to, the, to, to the Greeks in Turkey, that Turkey adopted a modern or a secular view saying that, look, we have nothing to do with religion. We don't, we don't discriminate uh, for religion in our country, so don't pressure us for the Armenians to have some posts that they have lost. So becoming secular was a political move. But the mindset of the 1915s, of 1920s, has always been religious. So I do not accept today's Turkey being, being secular. Let me tell you, uh, Turkey's biggest ministry is the Ministry of Religion. The number of people getting paid by the state is much more than the next three ministries combined. Every single religious uh, leader in a in a in a you know a mola or a hoja in a in a mosque is a government employee, and they recite every week what the government gives them. 
This is the government interpretation of the religion. Can this be a secular government? It never was, it never is, it never will be if, if it stays this way. So uh, don't, uh, don't buy the, don't buy the uh, uh, propaganda that Turkey was or is a secular state. So the mentality continued the same way. I'm going to go uh, through these a bit. Um, let me... Uh, we have gone through this. Okay. So just to show you, just to show you in 1915 what had to happen in order for modern Turkey to be born was that there were several reasons, and I have to cite these because today we are going to be talking about the same reasons that's happening with the Kurds. Turkey felt that in order to uh, be the, you know, the world ruler again, they had to start wars with Russia. As one poem went uh, uh, around that time is that the Turkish sword is like the compass, that it always points to the north. Meaning that Russians, no matter what, are our enemies. Why? One thing is that we had to take over Russia, then we were going to take over uh, Afghanistan, then we were going to take over India, China, to establish the Turkish Empire that we were you know, promised by God. So they attacked, uh, they attacked Russia several times and got beaten. And then Russia beat them up uh, in Balkans, in, in the Crimea, and Turkey had to pull back. But one other uh, nation stood, or, or one other obstacle was in the way of moving to the east, it was the Armenians. Armenians had to go for several reasons. One is that they were in the way of Turks moving to the east and uh, grabbing all that land. That's number one. Number two, which is maybe more important, is that Again, coming to that mentality of nationalism and why, what went wrong with the Ottomans, why did it collapse, was that we had, uh, we had uh, enemies within us that, uh, you know, knifed us in the back and they were, all those enemies were actually non-Muslims, Greeks, Armenians. Those were the biggest groups, uh, even some Alevis, you know, even they are Muslim, but they so the ideology of a new country, be it Ottoman or be it Turkish, was that it would not have any non-Muslim in there. And when the Treaty of Lausanne was, uh, was uh, signed, Turkey was able to pull the Kurds to its side, saying, look, we are of the same nation. Don't worry about you know, uh, your rights and everything. We will, of course, give them to you. You are, you are, you are with us. You are Muslim. The others are non-Muslim. They had to go. And Kurds were part of the Armenian genocide, actually. So, uh, so but the Kurds made the fatal mistake of believing in Turkey, in the Lausanne uh, Treaty, where they were promised that they could speak in uh, their own language, where they could have, remember this, they could have autonomy in their region. This was in the Lausanne uh, Treaty that Turkey signed. But... The minute it was signed and, it, uh, and uh, you know, Turkey was formed, immediately all of these were forgotten. Immediately, speaking Kurdish was banned. For, since 1920s, only like about 10 years ago, if you spoke Kurdish in Turkey, you would go to prison. There are authors who wrote an alphabet, Kurdish alphabet they published. They spent six or seven years in prison for publishing the alphabet, in, uh, you know, Kurdish alphabet for the kids. So I just want to tell you, uh, you know, the oppression that uh, came onto Turks, which will, uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, show us what, uh, what is happening today. This is the, uh, yeah, Turkey, uh, there are a lot of now progressive historians who are saying that if Turkey had abided by the Lausanne Treaty, 90% of the Kurdish question today would not have happened. 
And we're going to come to that. What, what do the Kurds want? What is, what is all this problem about? Since 19, uh, we are only going to look at the recent ones, uh, recent meaning from 1980s on, is that uh, there were many, many Kurdish uprisings in Alre, in uh, Dersim, in many places, and entire, every single one of them was actually suppressed with, uh, with blood. Uh, they even, you know, they, they brought the soldiers to, to uh, uh, fight the people, population, and many soldiers refused to even kill the population, so they had to bring other people in just to kill the babies, kill the children, women uh, in, in trenches. Uh, as you can see, this is one of the leaders of the, of the uh, Kurdish uh, revolutions elsewhere. And uh, Turkey tries to t uh, tell us that these revolts were not really Kurdish. They were really backward. They wanted to bring Islam back. Well, actually, Turkey was uh, Turkey told Kurds going to the going to the independence war that this war was to free the caliphate to establish the Islamic state again. And the Kurds joined them. And then when the Turks changed position to become secular because of the Armenian issue, then Kurds were left high and dry, saying, "Hey." we were fighting for Islam, Islamic State, you left us alone. And so Turkey now is trying to say that their, uh, their uprisings were actually religious in nature. But when you look at them, every single one of them is, is uh, emphasizing on the national side of the Kurds. And they're saying that we want autonomy, we want to rule our land as we wanted to, and you're not allowing us to speak our language, you're not allowing us to do anything that we, you promised us. And so they were revolting right in there. One of the um, first Turkish uh, women pilots uh, was that in uh, around 1938 was Atatürk's uh, daughter. She, pardon me. Well, yes, is a is a is a adopted adopted uh, uh, girl, uh, Armenian origin girl, and she was flying over villages, dropping bombs, and uh, for her uh, real good services. Now there's a Turkish airport named after her. Uh, these are the Turkish soldiers uh, sh showing the severed heads of the Armenians and the Kurds, I'm sorry, Kurds, uh, because they dare to try to speak their own language and do that. So uh, it's important because today the Turkish army is doing exactly the same thing. From 1990s, we have pictures of the Turkish army uh, playing soccer with the heads that they had severed from the Kurdish villages. So let's not forget that, uh, you know, that's a, So uh, what I'm trying to get here is that, that uh, we, we have to understand something if we ha were to understand the system in Turkey. Turkish system in 1923 was established and they were looking for where to go. One side is the Soviet Union and the communism or socialism there. And the other side is the United States, the rising imperialism. And although they played both sides, it was very pragmatic. They played both sides, but their eyes and heart and brain was on the United States and on the, to be on the side of imperialism. Especially they were having economic conferences where they were openly saying that the state has to create the capitalist class in order to become capitalist. Why? The reason is that, going back to the Ottomans, this is very important, going back to the Ottomans, with the relationship of the Armenians that they, they had with Europe, uh, with Russia, Armenians and the Greeks were the natural uh, capitalist class. Because in Turkish Islamic uh, system, it, it, you, you don't look good at the people who do trading. Trading is not very cool. Uh, uh, having, uh, you know, like uh, 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 arts, doing, doing many, you know, like arts and trying to sell them. That's not the way to advance in, in Ottomans. The only way to advance in Ottomans is to go to the palace and become a bureaucrat in the, in the we call it kapukulu, like, like a uh, dog, uh, you know, dog you would have on the, on the door. So that is the only way to advance. So Armenians and the Greeks, where uh, with their relationship to the other capitalist classes in the world, 
brought capitalism to Turkey. They were the only ones. Now, you got, uh, you know, you did a genocide against the Armenians, they're gone. You exchanged the Greeks, they're gone. And you want to be a capitalist and you don't have any capitalists. What the hell do you do? What you do is that you expropriate the Armenians' uh, capital. This is the number one thing. You expropriate it, and then with the help of the state, that's very important, state establishes a new class. State says, I'm going to be capitalist, and I'm going to give this to you, give this to you, give this to you. You become the capitalist. I'll help you find markets. I'll help you, you know, no taxes to you, uh, just as long as you make us capitalist. So that is how it has become. But there's a problem with this model. The problem is that capitalism in Turkey and many other uh, uh, neo-colonial countries has not developed with its internal dynamics. Remember, this is 1930s, 1920s. What had changed in the world at that time? We, the, the, the Turkey cannot become capitalist just uh, you know, like, oh yeah, we decide so we're going to be capitalist. But they have to be a, become a capitalist uh, at the time of the day. That is 1920s, when the capitalism has changed from a free market capitalism to an imperialist type. So Turkey has to play that role. What does it mean? The capitalist class in 1840s, in 1850s, as Marx writes it all along, has a, uh, has a progressive side in 1800s against the feudalism. It brings, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of thought. It's, you know, like the people are relieved from their feudal bonds. And so the working class is created, capitalists do this and so on. But Turkey never passes through those, uh, those uh, stages. It is born when there is, there is imperialism. It is born when there is monopoly capitalism. It is born with monopoly capitalism. That's very in interesting because that is what structures the Turkish system. Monopoly capitalism. Turkey never had a free market capitalism. It cannot because it's born in 1920s, 1930s, together with the others. But what does it mean is that it will not have even what we call the bourgeois democracy. Bourgeois democracy is the a uh, pretense democracy that we see in the metropolitan countries like United States, Germany, France, and all of that. There is a balance of forces. I'm not saying it's democratic. I'm saying bourgeois democracy. It is a, it is a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie on the working class. But it has the facade of democracy. Now, Turkey does not, cannot even put that facade. Every single time anybody tried to bring any kind of democracy or elements of democracy, they were just brutally, brutally uh, uh, suppressed. That is why the regime in Turkey has never been demo democracy, even in the sense of what we see in the Western countries. The regime in Turkey has always been a fascist uh, regime. What happens is that in times when the military comes, it turns into an open fascism, like all stops uh, taken out. But what about the other times, like what we are seeing today? Is, is the military ruling? No. So is there democracy? No. That is what most of the Turkish left says uh, or uh, analyzes it as a concealed fascism. We don't go from fascism to democracy like Germany did, like Italy did, and then back to fascism. No, that does not happen in Turkey. It does not happen. What happens is from open fascism to concealed fascism, and then back to open fascism again. Fascism doesn't change. I know this is a different concept of what we've learned in the, you know, Hitler and the Mussolini or Franco is that, you know, bottom up and... No, Turkish fascism is top down. Very interesting. It is not the same model we see in Germany. It's not because it's, it does not have bourgeois democracy, so that's why fascism doesn't come from bourgeois democracy. The contradictions in neo-colonial countries are so obvious, these contradictions, because why? Turkish capitalists, Turkish bosses, 
On one hand, they exploit the working class, but they are also exploited because they are part of the chain of the imperialist structure. So the capitalists in Turkey, they make profits, but they also dish it out to the United States, dish it out to Europe. They also have to pay a price. So the uh, capital accumulation that you see in capitalist countries does not happen at the rate that you see in the metropolitan countries. So the Turkish or the, or the you, you, you can say Egyptian, you can say, you know, whatever, those capitalists are connected, are dependent on the metropole countries. That's why they cannot have that facade of democracy to, you know, like brainwash people that we live in a democracy. Everybody knows in Turkey that we don't have a democracy. So that's why the regime there has only one choice to, to prevent uprisings, is that that's brutal, brutal fascism. So this was very well understood in 1960s, and people have, uh, have uh, revolted many times, especially in June 15, 16. The entire working class of Istanbul stood up, and they took over the entire town, entire city. Um, workers started marching on the highways. Entire highways were closed to Istanbul. They marched on the highways. The police came in. The, uh, the workers were just simply, you know, get rid of the police. Police couldn't do anything. The army had to be sent, and the army had to retreat in many places. The only way on uh, 1970 to, to bring, uh, bring uh, uh, stability, let's say. It was a, it was a revolutionary situation. The uh, union, union leadership, for the first time, were brought onto TV and radio, because otherwise the TV and radio was close to them. They were brought into TV and they appealed to the working class, please, please go back, it's okay, don't worry about it, we'll do something, I'll just go back. This was the union leadership. That's the only time when the workers retreated back. But entire factories were in the hands of the, uh, of the uh, working class. Entire city was in the hand of the working class. And they pulled it back. One of the reasons, okay, going back to that analysis of, a, uh, of the you know, neo-colonial type of capitalism is that the crisis, capitalist crisis there is continuous. This is very different than what you would see in the United States or Germany. Because of that reason, you know, the, uh, the, that the Turkish bosses have to give part of their, their uh, you know, the uh, profits to the imperialist bosses the, uh, the, and the relationship of the imperialism, it means that the countries are always in crisis. What that also brings is that the revolutionary situation is always present. Remember, let's go back to Lenin and how he defines revolutionary situation. When the working class it cannot be ruled anymore and the, worki, wor, uh, and the uh, capitalists cannot rule anymore, that is when the crisis starts to happen. But this is the situation every day in Turkey. Here it becomes like 2008 or something like that. There's a political issue and there's a crisis. It happens and then maybe they wash it over. In Turkey, every single day, because of this structural problem that the situation is revolutionary. The problem is that, well, again, let's go back to the Lenin's definition, objective conditions for revolution and subjective conditions for revolution. Uh, here, right now, I don't believe that in the United States we have the objective conditions when the crisis is so big that people are revolting and so on and so forth. But the subjective condition is the working class party that can lead the revolution. In Turkey, the situation, the objective situation is always ready. But what is lacking is the subjective conditions. In places like United States, in Germany, France, you have to wait for the objective conditions to mature, and then you should have the subjective conditions of the working class party. That's when you can uh, have a, a, a revolutionary uh, movement happening. But in places like Turkey, all you need is the subjective condition, because the objective conditions are always mature, always right. Because, uh, because imperialism brings this contradiction there. 
So this is the military coup that happened and uh, uh, so uh, this is a guy, uh, uh, just to show you the oppression that happened is uh, uh, they even had to raise the age of underage kids to hang them. And this is one of the revolutionaries. He was a, he was a child yet, but uh, with court order they increased his age and then they hung him. Uh, uh, so this is... Uh, Okay, this is where the tanks are in, ta in everywhere, and the uh, fascist party's leader says, uh, he was also arrested, but he says that we are in prison, but our ideology is in the state. So what he's saying is that those who made the, uh, the counter-revolution coup are uh, exactly uh, thinking like what we are doing. Uh, Kurdish was a, uh, was a taboo subject, and uh, again, as I mentioned, and Diyarbakir uh, prison has been one of the worst in the world of, of torture, of oppression, suppression, whatever you would, would like to call it. Just to give you an example, when, after years, if people had a chance to talk to their families, the time allocated to, for you to talk to your family is 45 seconds. So your family comes, they go through all kinds of checks and you know, uh, 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 strip searches and so on and so forth. You have only 45 seconds to talk to them before they take you away. This is the best privilege you have. I mean, what, people were happy even to have this. Yes, visiting time, 45 seconds. Um, unbelievable tortures and everything, and uh, let's go this. Okay, birth of PKK. Uh, PKK came out from the Turkish left. We have to understand the, the background of the Turkish left. It's mostly what you can call is a Stalinist uh, background, uh, looking at Soviet Union or China, Vietnam, and uh, uh, trying to come up with some kind of a theory on how to do the revolution in Turkey. One thing I found as a, as a difference from here and uh, in the neo-colonial countries is that our time is mostly spent on the theory of revolution. What to be done? What, how can we do it? Is it this model? Is it that model? And I don't see that much here. Maybe it is because the revolution is maybe looked at as something far in the future because, uh, you know, again, the objective and the subjective conditions are not mature enough. But there, since we analyze that the objective conditions are ready, so all the left has to do, if they are credible, is to come up with ways of how to do the revolution. PKK, when it was formed in 1970s, uh, was a split off from the uh, regular left, let's say, with uh, emphasis on the Kurdish, uh, Kurdish issues. And they adopted a more of a Maoist, Maoist model of uh, surrounding the cities from the fields. Because Kurdish uh, environment is an agricultural environment, it's a, it's a you know, like a more, let's say, backward uh, environment. Uh, so that's what a more feudal relationships go there. And more mountainous areas where the guerrilla could hide in the mountains, which has proven to be a very, very successful uh, strategy. So the leftists moved to the mountains and they started in 1984 by attacking a Turkish military outpost. That is when PKK showed itself. And the, the Workers' Party of PKK, they call themselves, and the star still is there showing, uh, you know, how the Maoist and, uh, you know, the revolutionary structure is there. This is uh, uh, Abdullah Öcalan. And Turkey was, again, just like the other Kurdish uh, uprisings, Turkey was brutal in, uh, in its attack. And coming to 1990s, I, I have to uh, uh, go fast, is that 1990s, uh, Turkey, one, Turkey going through a huge economic crisis had to again uh, find itself the scapegoat and Kurds became that way. But not only because of that, but the Kurds were now becoming more, you know, they would uh, uh, stress their identity. 
Remember that the Turkish uh, state was formed with one nation. And there's a whole lot of people, Kurds now, saying, I am not Turkish. And that is not acceptable in Turkey. If you are not Turkish, that is not acceptable. You have to accept assimilation. Otherwise, uh, you are an enemy of the state. So in 1990s, Kurds started saying, no, we are not Turkish. Sorry, but we are not. So the unbelievable oppression, again, uh, we went to Turkey with uh, Steve and, uh, and visited some of the newspapers that only after a few days got bombed, Özgür Gündem. Uh, nearly every single intellectual, Kurdish intellectual, was under threat. Many of them disappeared, as they are called, uh, tortured, and their bodies sometimes found, sometimes not found. But it was the time when the Turkish prime minister goes into the National Security Council and she says openly to the generals, saying, how can a Kurdish newspaper gets published. What kind of a country is this, she says. And three days later, in an in an, uh, you know, bombed attack to three of the offices, uh, one person died and the entire offices got destroyed by, uh, by bombs, uh, by the Turkish police. So that started it all. And millions of Kurds, again, this is important because it's going to reflect to today, millions of Kurds were forced, forced out of the area uh, just following the scorched earth uh, campaign that the United States had uh, done in Vietnam. Scorched earth. They, they even called it the same thing in Turkish, that the people had to be evacuated. Now that destroyed the whole animal husbandry in Turkey because it was the agrarian place. That's where all the, you know, the agriculture was done. So that came to a screeching halt. While millions of Kurds had to leave their uh, places and come to metropolitan places where the, if somebody had, a, had a, um, a relative or so, so now you had like 25, 30 people living in a uh, you know, one-bedroom home and begging on the street or you know, trying to find jobs and so on and so forth. This is very interesting because today, if you talk to Turkish people, uh, mostly nationalists, about the plight of the Kurds and that they want autonomy, the first thing you're gonna hear is this, oh yeah, they want uh, autonomy, then let them get the hell out of our country. They can go back to their Kurdistan, leave us alone, and then, you know, th then they can have it all. But they don't realize, understand that it was a Turkish army who evacuated, who emptied out the entire region with millions of people pushing them to the metropolitan places for easy and cheap labor. That was the result of it uh, with unbelievable exploitations. Um, so wh what we are seeing is that the thing that happened to Armenians, because they were not one of us, what happened to the Greeks, because they were not one of us, is now happening to the Kurds, because they are not one of us. It started with the religious community, now it became an ethnic uh, racist uh, uh, theme where if you are not a Turk, then you are not accepted until you accept to become a Turk. This is how the 1990s evacuations was happening. Especially, I would like you to keep those in mind because today, right now, when we are talking about this, this is what's happening in Kurdistan again. This is 1990s, army comes in and says, if you don't leave your home in the next three hours, we are coming down and burning it, and they did. We have many photographs of people who burned in their own homes because they refused to leave with their carcass and you know, their bones all over the place. They're, they are available. I didn't want to gross you out. But this is the way that the Kurdish people had to leave in few hours notice. There was not a, uh, there was not a single um, uh, forest left because the Turkish army, again, with the scorched earth uh, mentality, was burning down the forests in the east because the guerrilla was hiding in there. 
I remember in those days we were doing translations uh, and, uh, you know, ecology. Uh, new, uh, uh, I found this very progressive, very leftist ecological uh, uh, newspaper or a magazine and we were uh, uh, contributing to it by, by translating articles. So when this was happening, I called them and said, hey, this is great. I mean, let's start writing about what, the, what is happening to the forests in Turkey. The army is burning it down. They just shut the phone on me saying that, and these are academicians. They are saying, we are not going to write anything about that. They shut the phone on my face. Because you cannot talk about what the army does in Turkey. One state, one nation, one language. Turkey is, like I said, was born in imperialism and is a junior partner. It's a NATO, NATO country. So Turkey does not have the independence to do what it wants to. If Turkey shoots down a, a Russian plane, it cannot do it by itself. And as later on came out with the Russian plane, that a plane from Saudi Arabia, AWACS plane was up, uh, and then there was a US plane that flew from uh, Greece, and they did a triangulation <coughs> to pinpoint the Russian plane and bring it down. It is, uh, it is proven now that that is what happened, that Turkey won't uh, say anything and the United States won't say anything at all on that part. So I'm just trying to say that Turkey does not even have the independence. Yet, let me jump ahead. The difference that today's government will have from the previous one is that Erdogan, whatever he does, whatever, he is modeling Turkey after Israel. We have to understand that. Because he looks at Israel as a successful model. If Israel has uh, many uh, lobbying, uh, this is how he sees it. Why is Israel so successful? Oh, because they have lobbying, uh, lobbying uh, firms in the United States. Let's remember that Erdogan is the only non-Jew that uh, received awards from the Jewish lobby, Zionist lobby in the United in, in, in the world. The only one, one and the only one non-Jewish person who won awards for peace and honor from the Zionist lobby. He was so close to them. And today there are several, several uh, lobbying firms in, in Washington. That is doing exactly what Israel is doing with Turkish money. They are trying to gain credit, credit just like Israel did. Because their, in their view is that, oh, if you have lobbyists, stay. You have to, you know, the United States will love us as well. The model that Turkey is after, one other thing, like in the, in the internet today, if you were to go in and write anything against the ruling party, you'll immediately get hit by trolls. These are all government uh, hired trolls modeled after the Israel's, uh, you know, uh, uh, hiring of the uh, uh, university students to attack anybody that says anything against Israel. And uh, the, the, uh, the attacks uh, on the uh, Kurdish population. If you please look at it today, uh, Gulden was mentioning to me, most of the Turkish police is now plain clothes uh, uh, police. This happened after all those videos came out, how the Israelis are now pretending to be the demonstrators, and then they act together with the Palestinians, and then suddenly they swarm to somebody, they grab him and push, pull him back, and you know that they're not the demonstrators, they were actually Israeli. For Turkish uh, state is now doing this exactly the same way. Here is the Turkish uh, mentality at this point, is that Turkey can become a better dog than Israel for the United States. Why? Because Israel is Jewish. It doesn't fit into the Islamic Middle East. Uh, Israel have more people from the Europe in there. The white people right in the middle of brown people doesn't fit in there. So Turkey is there. Turkey is Muslim. But it can do exactly what the uh, Israelis can do but do it in, under the Islamic mask so that people can, you know, the, remember only a few years ago, 
they worshipped, uh, the, the whole Middle East worshipped the ground that Erdogan was walking. Why? Because he screamed one minute, one minute to uh, Shimon Perez, I think it was, uh, to the Israeli uh, uh, premier on the, on the TV, and then he sent the Marmara, uh, you know, the, uh, to break the siege of Gaza, and so he became the hero. So he's playing on that, showing you to United States that I can do a better job than Israel. But the United States is telling Turkey, okay, show me, show me that you can. You can win w wars. So that required a change in the Turkish system. Why? Because since 1920s, the Turkish army has been set up in such a way to deal only with the internal enemy. Kurds, Armenians, or uprisings. But now, the Turkish army has to prove itself outside of Turkey. Now, in order to do this, in the conflict like in Syria, what is happening is that Turkey is trying to force the hand of United States, but working together with it by uh, putting soldiers in Syria. Uh, in Iraq, I'm so sorry, in Iraq. And the United States had to, con uh, uh, to warn Turkey twice to pull the soldiers out. But Turkey is, uh, on the same day that Obama said, uh, just a couple of days ago, that the Turkish army had to leave Iraq, the same day there was staged an attack to the Turkish army, which did never happen. Not a single Turkish soldier got wounded or whatever. And the Kurds are today saying it's a lie. So it's like, a, and Turkey saying, see, we have to be there. So it is trying to do what Israel has done. Go in, take some place, and force the hand of United States to, uh, to support you. Why? Because you're a NATO member. This is the plan that Turkey is trying to do in the Middle East. Now, it also fits into another grand plan. Remember the Armenians. They were in, the, in uh, blocking Turkey's access to Asia. So they had to go. Today, imagine if Turkey is going to go into Syria, if Turkey is going to go into Iraq, who is standing in front of Turkey? No, nobody but Kurds. So Kurds have to pay a price. One, internally Kurds are now, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, 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 they are pushing for their identity. They are not being, you know, Turkified. Two, they are in the way of uh, they are in the way of uh, Turkey expanding into the Middle East to create that Islamic state once again. Third is that the Turkish Kurds are a little different than you would, the Kurds you would see in Syria and Iraq. They are much more progressive. I don't know how many people saw the film Good Kurds, Bad Kurds. Bad Kurds being the Kurds in Turkey. Why? Because of those, that flag that you saw with the, with the star and having Maoist background, you know, revolutionary, communist type of a, uh, t uh, organization, that is bad for the whole region. And we start seeing that after the elections. What happened is that uh, Erdogan, Erdogan uh, unilaterally said that, okay, just before the elections, there was a discussion period between the Kurds and the Turkish government. They were on a table, they were discussing, they were talking, uh, some, some rights were given to, Tur to Kurds to speak their language and so on and so forth. But when the Kurdish uh, party won more than 10%, that is the time to punish them. And the president says that, he said, I kicked the table that we were having, uh, having negotiations on. I kicked it down, he said. And he also unilaterally said, whether you like it or not, the Turkish regime has changed. This is illegal. He has no power. He has no right. But again, remember, Turkey is not democratic. Right? Oh, so he can unilaterally say, whether you like it or not, I've just changed the system. So the Kurds said, in response to this, OK, if you change the system, we too are now pushing for our rights. And one of the rights is that they started imposing very, very interesting, which I want to especially talk about it here, is the self-rule. What the self-rule is, remember I said that in the, uh, in the uh, local governments, when HDP won in elections, they would also bring a woman as a co-chair, as a co-mayor. 
This is a step in the, in the uh, uh, self-governance. They are trying to change the system, and I'm going to come to the systemic analysis of this, is that what they are saying is this. Uh, we need people not being ruled. We need people participating in the way that they have their lives. In uh, Kobani, in Iraq, in Syria, where the Kurds take, this, uh, take the rule, they are doing an unbelievable experiment. Women are up to their eyeballs in everyday life. Ecological agriculture has started. They are trying to implement more democratic, like everybody's participation in everyday so that there's transparency. Now, once I put this model, I want to step back a bit. Where did this come from? Why are the Kurds doing this? First of all, let's say, who brought this ideology? It was the Kurds in Turkey that brought this ideology, not the Kurds in Iraq, not the Kurds in Syria, unfortunately. That's why they are the bad Kurds, because they have ideas, man. Uh, so that's not acceptable. What, where do these ideas come from? It comes from Abdullah Hocalan. He's the leader of the PKK in prison today. And Turkey wants, uh, uh, by the way, it was the CIA who caught Abdullah Öcalan Apo and gave it uh, him to Turkey. So let's not, uh, the, you will hear many people say that Kurds are a puppet of the United States. So let's remember this, that it was CIA who captured their leader and gave it to Turkey. But Abdullah Öcalan has gone uh, as a Marxist, as a Leninist, as a Maoist, he has gone through some, some uh, changes with the changes of the world. He, I don't think that he has abandoned these basic rules, but he is saying that he goes back to the right of nations to self-determination, Leninist principle. In 1990s, in 1980s, it was, it, was, uh, it was important that Marxists, Leninists, uh, abide by the right of nations to self-determination. But Öcalan looks at this and says, is this still valid? Reason, right of nations to self-determination puts the state in the center of the discussion. Because that discussion, when it came with the Lenin and the rest of the Marxists, was that each nation that wanted independence have to have its state. So put the state first, and then build the people around it. But Öcalan is now saying, guys, that's an old story. Maybe we need a nation first, more humane, more democratic organization, and then maybe or maybe not the state. What this does is that opens the door for the Kurds to, instead of revolting, changing states, changing borders, uh, creating new states, destroying that state, instead of this, what he's saying is, be where you are, but start implementing democracy. This is why the uh, self-rule experimentation is happening in Turkey today. And that's why the Turkish army has called in more than 10,000 troops with six, uh, 36 colonels and six generals uh, just uh, combi uh, you know, coordinating the effort of the attack against the Kurds because they're saying they want self-rule. Oh, it's against our one nation, one state, one language. So that's why unbelievable attack to the, to the environment right now. So at the heart of it, I mean, I have a lot of uh, things to show, but let me uh, uh, fast forward, is that let us think about this alternative. I don't know personally if I subscribe to Öcalan's model of let's create nation. And he, he, he explains that there are many different nations, uh, a military nation, a, a, a state nation, a, uh, you know, like a, a ruling nation. But then he also puts a democratic nation. What he's calling Kurds to do is to change from a state nation, be transformed into a democratic nation. And that democratic nation principle in its heart carries all the institutions you would have 
but working democratically and in a collaborative way, but kind of independent, but still in a unity together. Participation of the people, democracy, and more you know, futuristic uh, environment. So that is the model that's coming up, and that's what the attack in uh, Kurdistan we are seeing today. I can maybe later on uh, show more uh, videos of the attacks and uh, oppression just because of this democratic uh, experimentation. We have uh, a guest also here uh, that's going to issue a solidarity statement from ILWU retired Longshoreman, who's a member of the Transport Workers Solidarity Committee, the chair, Jack Heyman. So welcome. I just want to make a few brief comments. First about solidarity, working class solidarity, and then uh, more generally about the history uh, and politics in the Middle East. So uh, Mehmed mentioned earlier on about Erdogan's uh, trying to play a hero and having the Mavi Marmara lead a freedom flotilla to Gaza. Um, and in, in that episode, the Israeli army landed soldiers on the ship and killed people. I think nine people were killed in that. Um, and that, that outraged uh, so many people uh, who were defenders of Palestinian rights. Uh, we in the Longshore Union here in the Bay Area looked very closely at what the South African dock workers did in 2009. And they struck against an Israeli ship, the Johanna Rus, because the Israelis were already beginning a genocidal attack against the Gazans. So the following year, 2010, a Zim ship came into the port of Oakland and we organized along with many of the Arab and Muslim communities here in the Bay Area, as well as people who were opposed to Zionism. And mass pickets were put up early in the morning, June 2010 that was. And longshoremen refused to cross the picket line. Now, the significance of that is that there has never been a job action by the working class in this country against the Zionist regime. This was the first time it happened. And as a lot of you know, it happened last year in August and again in, in September uh, when the Zim ships came in again. Um, so anyway, we have a, a, a long history of international solidarity not only in fighting apartheid in South Africa, but also with the Palestinian people. Um, and it's, it's those kinds of actions that are really going to be needed when they're, they're, they're on the brink of a civil war in Turkey right now. Kurds are being genocidally attacked, as Mehmed documented. Uh, and we have a role to play in this country, the soup, one of the superpowers of, of capitalism in the world today, of imperialism. Uh, the working class in this country has a role to play, like we did in a small way with the Mavi Marmara solidarity protest and with the anti zim protests just last year. Now, I think what's key to the Kurdish situation, and you have to go back a hundred years actually to World War I, because what happened after World War I and after many great wars like that, they lead to revolutions. In World War I, three of the great dynasties in the world were overthrown. The Habsburg Empire was defeated. The Tsarist Empire was defeated, and there was a, a workers' revolution, the first successful workers' revolution led by Lenin and Trotsky. The Ottoman Empire collapsed, and the Ataturk uh, Republicans uh, took over. So here you have three major 
uh, monarchies and empires being defeated and, and, and the whole world is being reshuffled. The dominant powers were Western European capitalism. And so at the end of World War I, there was a secret treaty between the Western imperialists, the British and the French, and that treaty was called the Sykes-Picot Treaty that divided up mm -hmm. the entire exactly. Middle East. It had nothing to do with ethnic groups or religions, um, languages. It had simply to do with resources, mainly oil, and that's where the lines were drawn. The Kurds, who have every, every right to self-determination, they actually make up uh, a nation along the borders of Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. And I don't know why Ashalan would say uh, if they defeat ISIS and Assad in, in, in Syria that they should just lay down their arms. I mean, they are a nation state in that area, contiguous with Turkey and, and Iraq. They're the best fighters in Iraq as well. So, um, you know, I, I think we have to look at what's happening right now. And that is that Turkey is on the brink of a civil war. We have a side to take in that civil war, and that is for the right of self-determination for the Kurds who are being genocidic, genocidally massacred, and with the proletariat, the working class in Turkey. Turkey is the key to what happens in the Middle East. If there is a civil war, if it breaks out, it's not a, a given that Erdogan and the fascists uh, to the right of him are going to win because it's a very powerful proletariat. It's the, it's the largest and, and most militant proletariat in the Middle East. Uh, I've been there a few times and I've been to some of these workers' conferences and most of them are underground because the government is so repressive in, in Turkey. But the largest concentration of Kurds it's not in the area called Kurdistan, uh, of a, a major metropolitan area, it's in Istanbul. If the Kurds can link up, and they already are playing a leading role in the working class in Turkey, there is the potential for a victory in the civil war, and a civil war in Turkey could lead to a revolution. And that could spread. You know, the imperialists talked about how wonderful the Arab Spring was. And what it's created is millions of refugees that are forced to uh, flee, most of them going to Europe, and uh, a slaughter, a genocidal slaughter taking place throughout the Middle East. So that's really got to stop. And, and I, I do have to say that I, I believe the Kurds are playing a vanguard role in taking on not only the, the, the nationalists, but the, the ISIS, the, 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 the caliphate. They want to go turn the clock back a, 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 a thousand years or more. And uh, there are a few left groups, like the Spartacist League, that actually give military defense to ISIS. I, I can't believe that. That has to be explained. I, I don't understand that. If a Kurdish soldiers are fighting ISIS, we need to stand on the side of the Kurds. And if it's a Kurdish woman in arms fighting ISIS, we need to support, defend the Kurds. Um, you know, the imperialists play all sides on these conflicts in the Middle East. We have to focus on where the working <laughs> class is, and in particular, what's happening to the Kurds. And I, I believe, in a more positive sense, I believe that there is a possibility that out of a civil war in Turkey, it could be turned into a workers' revolution, not dissimilar to what happened in the Soviet Union. What is lacking, and you're absolutely right, is the subjective factor. We need a mass revolutionary workers' party.